most of you know that I was an associate professor at Melbourne University because you read the bottom of my emails, but I just thought I'd tell you this time what I was an associate professor of, and that is biochemistry, which is the most wonderful subject in all of the sciences. If you don't believe me, I'll say it again. Biochemistry is a wonderful subject. It's, it explains everything about how that colourful meal you just had comes out the sort of uniform colour at the other end and keeps you alive. Now that's biochemistry. And the picture you see before you is a mixed audience of physiotherapy and medical students. If any of you have a medico who went to Melbourne University after 1991, chances are they'll remember me as a lecturer. So ask them, did you know Graham Parslow was a lecturer? And you never, <laughs> and you never know the answer. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, quite a lot remember me. So uh, ask your medico if they remember Graham Parslow in biochemistry. I also taught science. Uh, biosciences, optometry, dentistry and agriculture. So there's a pretty big spectrum of people I taught at that time. Uh, nowhere is electronics in my background of uh, uh, academic qualifications. So that's my specialty there. Uh, the first one I was going to go through with you, I won't be able to finish the talk, I'm well aware that uh, there are constraints here, but I thought I'd show you a restoration of an Aster Porter. And this is one that I got about 15 years ago in my very first uh, era of collecting radios. I bought a radio off someone uh, near Bendigo, went up, and he said, I've got a whole pile of other stuff here, and by the way, you can have this for free. I don't know what it is, but I think it's a radio. And it ended up looking like this. I got this. It was a three-sided box, and it had an escutcheon on the top and a rather broken speaker gr gr grill. And you saw what it turned out like, and how did I go through doing that? Well, the first thing I did, because I'm a biochemist, everyone's going digital these days and throwing out wonderful old analog equipment. And one of the chief things a biochemist uses is called a spectrophotometer, which measures absorbance and transmittance. And from the salvage one from my department, I just happened to have a beveled dial, which you see there in white, and this shows absorbance here and transmittance there. Uh, to anyone who casually looked at it, it might look like it was meant for the radio. Uh, so I was very proud of that little substitution. Another dodge which you'll find here is the knob. In fact, that's only a half knob. When I looked through my knobs to do the job, I only found one which would do it, and I said to myself, two halves make a hole, so you have a hole restoration from two halves. Uh, so uh, be prepared to adapt to whatever happens. December last year, I was very lucky, I did acquire a real porter and it looks like that. My personal preference is uh, my own special little uh, dial, which has got a lot more character than the original one designed by Aster. So here it is, that's in the progress, uh, glued in plywood, uh, filler to make it work, respray, and it ends up like this. And for the replacement of the broken here. dial, you go to your plastics bin, and I found some chocolate-coloured plastic, which by choosing the right bit and cutting it, exactly matched the profile of the bit that was missing. So always be imaginative, and always look through your surplus and storage bin, and something will always come up if you keep enough of the right things. And tell your wife that uh, every time you do this, because I always ask, why do you keep these things? So you've got to reinforce that there is a rainy day that these things come to be useful for. There was no radio, so what did I do? Stick a six inch uh, speaker in it and an RCA socket, and so I can plug something else into it. It will look the real business, and it, it's the easy way out to do the whole thing. Now, to replace that banding pattern where there's no fabric, uh, I looked into my bin, and this is left over from school children. Our school kids use this to cover their school books. And it looked like it had potential, so cut out the right strip, stick it on and it looks like that. Also the porter badge that you see there was bought from eBay. It cost me $15 but it just made the job so much uh, more professional adding the porter badge. And here's a comparison. That's what the one I got in December looks like. It's the real one. And in a funny way I'm still very happy with my reconstructed porter which was made from minimal information and gives me an example of what they look like. Now I'm going to take you into what happens when your kids leave home and you have much joy and celebration. 
because they've got a spare room, as Charlie pointed out. So you can populate it uh, with your radio collection. And this is the west wall of my radio room, uh, formerly my son Nathan's, uh, Matthew's uh, bedroom. And I'll just leave you for 20 seconds to recognise a few of those radios. Uh, Self-test, how many do you recognise? Quite a few of them. Quite a few of them. Uh, and Phil should know because if, if you've seen Phil's collection, he's got quite a few of them. So, uh, and as we turn around, we get to this uh, side. That's the north side and the east side. And I'm going to talk about these two HMV radios, which I've got an arrow there. And I'll just give you 10 seconds to see how many you recognise there. Uh, Phil, have you got quite a few of them? Phil's got quite a few of them. And Charlie uh, recognises them too. So, uh, All up, I've got about 600 radios in my collection. Round of applause for Diane. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Diane is a, is a wonderful woman, uh, uh, but she has one very strict rule. I'm not allowed to build another shed, which I could do. And in anything which I get in, something's got to go out. She accepts 600, uh, but that, there's a very, very firm line, and I get a free divorce for going over it. So, <laughs> it hasn't collapsed yet. Right, are those two HMVs there? One is a four valve, one's a five valve. Now, the five valve one, which is down the bottom corner here, the 886, has got a bigger case. And there's no reason for it to have a bigger case, except it's got a bigger price. Because inside them, they have exactly the same chassis, with the exception that if you look carefully about here, there's an extra octal socket, which is the fifth valve going in. Apart from that, it's exactly the same hardware between the two. Now, luckily, I acquired the 886 before I was given the very sad model 456 to restore. They both sound much the same. But I, let's go into the restoration of the 456. I wrote it up in silicon chip, and this is just going to go through very briefly, because I'm going to talk about Little Nipper, who's down the bottom here. There's Little Nipper, and there's quite a bit of interesting history about Little Nipper, who is the uh, terrier that is shown there. A bloke called Francis uh, Barad painted that diagram, and the newly formed gramophone company from 1899 purchased it. And they thought, that was a darn good idea. We bought this painting. Let's stick it on our gramophone records. And they did. And later on, when they became far more diversified, they used the brand name, His Master's Voice, and they formed the conglomerate called EMI, which is Electronic Music Industries in the 30s. So the HMV, EMI, they're all the same thing in the gramophone company. Now, about a couple of years ago, I was uh, playing with some 78 records, and one did what it does, it slips, and it, it didn't come back intact. So what did I do with it? I thought... Gave it to the dog. <laughs> uh, the, the, the dog didn't get my broken 78. I looked at it, and I went to the shed, and I trimmed it down to the uh, hub there, and for two years, that's been my drink coaster on my study bench. <laughs> so. Uh, next time you break a 78, you might consider a similar event. Now, just digging into that article from Silicon Chip, I thought I'd mention that the output pentode on this one, which is an EL33, went gassy. And you've got this beautiful purple plasma display. And a lot of people have seen the plasma display. For a low... Uh, grade use like a pentode for audio, it'll work perfectly happily uh, with a plasma display and you can enjoy it. I don't recommend it, but uh, anyway, there was a plasma display. And I just thought I'd uh, talk about Lee de Forest. Lee de Forest, why is he famous? He invented the triode. the triode. Yeah, but he was a complete dill when it came to understanding the physics. And in fact, he always insisted on having a bit of gas in his triodes, and uh, he thought it was the plasma that conducted the electricity when it was the electrons. He got it dreadfully wrong, and there was no progress from Lee to Forrest, because he just got the uh, physics entirely wrong. And other people like Armstrong came along, got the physics right, and made progress, and put in high vacuum, and that's how it came about. But Lee de Forrest invented the triode, became famous, but he was completely a dill, and got the rest of it wrong. He spent the rest of his life uh, fighting for the uh, patents that he uh, uh, thought were all his, and uh, 
a bit of a deal. Oh well. Uh, yes, it it, it 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 does. Of course, it does. Yes. So next time you get a plasma display before you replace the valve, have a look at the uh, trans uh, the, the load and how it plays beautiful little musical uh, ultraviolet signatures. Here's where I started on that four valve. It was a gift from someone in the Mustang Car Club, surprisingly. When it gets known that you uh, collect radios, and you should always promote that you collect radios, because someone will step off and say, I've got this old radio, I'll give it to you. And this was a gift from someone in the Mustang Car Club. And there it was, it looks a little bit sad. Um, in fact, this is where I uh, mentioned Ray Gillette. Is Ray still here? Ah, Ray taught me that uh, uh, you can add value to a radio by having extra ventilation. So um, <laughs> this one has the glory of extra ventilation by not having a side on it. Uh, it's every ventilation you can think of, Charlie. And so this is what I started with, a chassis, if I use a stick here, which had no dial, and all that you get is a black background here, and what I did was take the one I had, you'd take a photograph of the dial you've got, you just print it on ordinary paper, you stick the paper on the back, and also the cursor was broken off, and all this cursor is here is a bit of stiff white hookup wire. So very easy to just bend it in and stick it in to do the job. Now I'm going to show you how I replaced the side. And the woodwork is unremarkable. Most people here could just do the woodwork. The tricky thing was going to Autobahn and buying some chrome striping. As you see, you've got these ridges here to match, and all I did was use chrome striping, paint over it, and you've got a pretty good match to go through. Almost everything you do to repair a car, you could use to repair radios. So go, go to your local autobahn, Repco, whatever, and get started on radio repairs. In the end, you end up with a radio which looked quite good, just a few points. These celluloid overlays here are very hard to do as a home job. I'll show you how I bodge it up from time to time, but uh, by and large, I'm going to tell you to go to Carl Taller in Canberra and buy the ones that he's already got printed off. It needs screen printing and commercial premises to do it. It's really not a home job to do a reproduction like that. Now, for two years, the radio I got went knobless because HMV knobs are, you go through thousands of them, and eventually, if you spend two years going through thousands of knobs, you catch up with them. But you all know the rare ones. They're the ones you never find in anyone else's collection of 2,000 knobs. So they're as rare as hen's teeth. Just a plug for my mate Carl. I was speaking to him only yesterday. Uh, I really like Carl, and he's really dedicated to getting the best price and the best quality he can for reproduction parts. You'll have noticed that this advert appears in radio waves, so it's easy to get to it, just the back page of radio waves. And he's always increasing his range. <coughs> if you talk to him personally, he will even go out of his way to make new parts to your own order. So I highly recommend Carl. He's in it because he's a radio lover and does a great job. Uh, this is just a picture of my, one of my BPJ Astors with his reproduction knobs. There are a couple of knobs that always fail. Those BPJs, HMVs, and there's some really rotten knobs out there. Phillips did a few too. On the subject of that chrome trim, which I sh introduced here. Here is a 1947 Finnish radio called Helvar, and this is exactly like the original. Uh, they were missing, but I know exactly what it should look like, so just trim it back there. And here's one, which is an Echo U700. This speaker grill here, I could not stretch in any way, shape, or form to uh, conform where, with where it should have been. It was shrunk, and that was it. So what did I do? I got my chrome trim, trimmed around it, and it looks infinitely superior. It almost looks like it should have been there. So always be prepared to be imaginative and find another solution for fixing those things. Now, Carl has got a good range of off the shelf, but if you want to make your own, this is how I do it. It requires taking some overhead transparency transparencies which go through a laser printer, some foil board, which is metalized cardboard, and absolutely infinitely useful, 
uh, glue sticks. I use glue sticks more than almost any other adhesive in doing things to stick labels on things and other miscellaneous small jobs. Extremely useful. I laser print out the artwork like this and I print it backwards. Why print it backwards? What's the difference between the top and the bottom? The top of something is subject to fingerprints and all sorts of erosion, but if you print it on the back, it's well and truly protected. So you reverse it, print it on the back, glue stick, stick it on gold foil like this, and that's the result you can get out of it. I, I'm very happy with that result, and I've printed up a bunch of them, and I've used it quite often. So it's not the same as the ordinary overlayer, but it does a very good imitation job of labelling your dials. Also in this, here's other reproductions you can do. Uh, Laurie Harris uh, was the fine purveyor of this uh, challenge to, to me, and a uh, number of things needed fixing, obviously. But I reproduced the Technico label here. Nearly all the Technico labels are damaged. I, I don't know how they always get damaged, but it's very common for them to be missing or damaged. So this reproduction, again, do the artwork, reverse it, paste it onto a gold foil, trim it down. I always use a guillotine for trimming. If you use scissors, you'll come unstuck every time. Uh, guillotine, uh, must use a guillotine to get it straight. And paste it up, and there you go. This one here belongs to uh, Bruce Wilkie. Some of you know Bruce Wilkie. And it's only got a minor dent there, but most of them are damaged in some way, those Technicos. Now, I did bring along two Technico fortresses. And one of them is the real McCoy. It's uh, all genuine, original, uh, and it's got its Technico intact. The other one's one I restored only a couple of weeks ago. And for that, it was missing the Technico label and I decided to make a different sort of reproduction to fix that one. Uh, yes, if you hold that one up, that's the real McCoy. You should come and have a look at this afterwards because I want to point out that this has got its original label and it's got its original dial. I copied that dial because the one on the next one was broken. So there's the uh, original and um, I'm keeping that one. And the next one I'm going to put in the auction at the end of April. And the, the two things I want you to notice are the a uh, reproduction on the second one there, which you see the Technico there. In fact, that's a positive print that's just printed on paper. It's a colorized Technico printed on paper and it's got some clear plastic uh, t pasted over the top of it, uh, to get, again, just using st uh, glue stick. And you can look at the result there. It's certainly better than how it started with a broken Technico. So some things are quite easy to do. That's just a positive print, it's not uh, clear. The clear is pasted on afterwards, so you can all do something like that to get it to work. Right, changing uh, topic. Oh, I also put, you should look at this too. You know, I pointed out in the HMV that I printed an, an entirely different uh, dial and pasted it behind. The second one is a paste behind dial because the original glass was broken. So when you look at this, compare a real glass dial with the reproduction and from 10 feet away, you really can't tell the difference. So when you've got a broken glass dial, be prepared to print something and stick it behind rather than have it at the front. You can do the comparison right there. When it comes to grill cloth, sometimes you can be overly fussy and sometimes you just can't get it right. I've, there's my grill cloth drawer. You look in and sometimes you're lucky, like with that HMV, I had some which is very close to the original and it was all very easy. So get the scissors out, uh, tape it in, glue it in, whatever. But sometimes the texture of the grill cloth is so unique that you can't really easily get it off the shelf. Here's a Philips uh, model, uh, well, some, sorry, Mullard, and you can see the texture on there. You wouldn't believe that the bottom one has been cleaned, but those spots there were highly resistant to coming out. I can tell you if you paint over them, that will bleed through. So to stop it bleeding, I use undercoat. And eventually, you'll get the undercoat to stop it bleeding through. And in this one, I stopped with the undercoat because I thought white's fine. And I matched it with uh, white pinstripes and then just printed off a mullard label, colorized, 
just printed on gloss photo paper, and that was the restoration there. The advantage is keeping the texture of that grill. Plastic paint or a spray can? Uh, that one was brushed. Uh, it was Torben's three-part uh, undercoat filler and goodness knows what else, uh, straight from Bunnings, and I use a lot of Torben's uh, three-feature uh, uh, undercoat. But that was a brush job. And it's a brush job because you can't fill as well with just a spray. It tends to uh, skate over the surface, but with a brush you can make sure that something as textured as that gets uh, filled in. Here's another Phillips, and that was a really strange uh, grill cloth there. And I undercoated it and then painted it with gold. And it came back uh, looking like that. And it did not have a dial plate on it, so I copied the dial plate from another one. And you can see it here in black and white, mostly because with the limited ability of a laser printer to uh, print colours, uh, black offers contrast. Now, it's not true to original, and if you practice and uh, if you look at enough uh, boxes you'll find a uh, genuine one but for the meantime getting on with the reproduction that you've made at least advances the whole issue so that was resprayed with gold after it was undercoated and it needs undercoat to stop the bleed through of those dark marks that you get rod are they overhead projector transparencies uh, that is an overhead projected transparency uh, on 8 inch thick plastic, uh, uh, use a glue stick again and uh, so you've got a flimsy one and you cut out uh, 8 inch uh, thick plastic. Have you ever tried using a colour laser printer? A colour laser printer? Uh, yes, I've got a colour laser printer. I've never been able to put a transparency through it in case it... Uh no, if you've got the right, uh, the kosher type of uh, transparency, it doesn't crinkle up. Uh, you've got to read on the box that says uh, laser compatible. Uh, but colour is not a problem, Rod. Uh, uh, testicle up and uh, give it a try. This will probably be the last thing I have time to, to, to go through with. I think I'm going to have to uh, give you the uh, other 90% of the talk on another occasion at the moment. And this is much to my regret, but hopefully you'll look forward to uh, a few more tricks uh, in due course later in the year when I can reschedule myself. But I want to convince you all to go away and download the GIMP, which literally stands for the New Image Manipulation Program I just say it's the Graphic Image Manipulation Program. It's a world organisation of people who have open source and all the smartest people in the world rewrite little bits of the GIMP so you can do the cleverest things instead of Photoshop, which is going to cost you an arm and a leg and is in impossible to understand anyway, download the GIMP. It's impossible to understand, but at least the, the price is right for the GIMP. There is no such thing as an easy image editing uh, suite. You've got to uh, learn how to do it. But some of the easiest things to do are illustrated here. There's a monarch at the top, and you see the background? Cutting out the background is relatively easy. So all those photographs which you messed up because uh, they had the dog in the background or something like that, you can cut them out and just get a nice crisp radio photograph. And also the brightness and contrast have been fiddled here. So you'll see some of the details at the bottom are much clearer than at the top. So if you didn't get the photograph with the right exposure first, don't go and take the photo again. Head for the GIMP and uh, uh, get your uh, photograph redone. So uh, I think this is the easiest way to get into taking good photographs. You take a bad photograph and eventually it looks like a real pro job. Why did I put a black uh, cursor on, uh, dial on that? It's because if I tried printing in different colours and all of them looked anemic. Only the black gave really good contrast, so I settled for good contrast and readability. It's not uh, true to uh, the original, but the black gave good contrast and I've tried everything else and it didn't really work in this context. Charlie. I've got one of those. Of course you have. There it is. It's on the bottom. Uh, yeah, Charlie lent me his uh, model uh, 135B. And that's because the one I had had the left-hand bit uh, off it, and Charlie's had the left-hand bit on it. So I put the... It's the bit. It's fallen off. I don't know where it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> It'll turn up in the chook pen. I, I, it's, no, it's, it won't be the Not the chook pen. Anyway, that allowed me to get the gimp and create this entirely intact uh, label, uh, the, the new dial from the whole thing. It's also, a, it's a lot of fun doing it and you challenge yourself and you feel really good at the end of getting it all back together again. Surprisingly, this colour at the bottom you see here does print out and it gives you the result of that. 
Now, that isn't all that flash, and I'm not going to say it's a perfect restoration, uh, isn't it wonderful, but it's better than having the bit missing. So any progress uh, for your uh, restorations is something worth doing. So I'm not going to make a big deal about that. And because of the time, I'm going to do a mega... I'll just talk about one restoration here. Um, Murphy's Law. Uh, if you put your, uh, a radio on the bonnet of your car and it can fall off, it will fall off. And uh, that's exactly what happened to this one. And the concrete was not damaged in the process. <laughs> what about your diet? <laughs> All good. But, uh, and I'll let you in on a secret on how I uh, restored this one. I bought another case. <laughs> so, when all else fails. Now, I'm just going to take you for a quick, quick, quick run through my shed. Uh, there I am. Inside the shed is my electrical bench. Mm -hmm. Looks like this. Happily working on a, a Chrysler anniversary radio at this stage here. And you'll notice a few aircraft flying through my airspace. Uh, I do have a love of aircraft, and I share this with a few people here. And. In the two years of COVID, I decided my Air Force was rather incomplete, so all of these planes were made uh, during the two years of COVID. And the skills required to make a model aircraft are almost identical to the skills required uh, to restore a radio, so they cross over. And my favourite in that is the F-111, which is in the top uh, right, left-hand corner, as you're looking at it. So, Uh, yes, yes. Uh, the F-35 down the bottom is our latest uh, fighter aircraft, and that's now our frontline aircraft, the F-35 there. And for ages it was impossible to get a model kit of it, but I eventually got one about four months ago, so that's my latest model that I've created. I get great joy out of that, and there's some more of my airspace, and you get uh, no points at all for recognising two radios. For recognising eight radios, you get one point. So that's the shed. And, well, you can see a Mustang, a Dakota, an F-111, a Measurement 262, etc. And that's just another shot of the shed, but I'm going to finish by uh, asking you, if you're interested in my radio collection, to look up my personal website, which is HRSA, that's easy to remember, number2.com. And you'll find my 600 radios there, my collection of tape recorders, uh, amplifiers, and also my collection of articles that I've written for silicon chip and radio waves. So if you think there was an article I wrote, you can look up hrsa2.com and you'll find the article collected there for you to look through. And the very last slide I'm going to share with you is my philosophy. It's extremely deep, so to, to just take a while to get yourself together. There's always an answer, and that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention.